Yeah, we gotta do something about that cold start. I am not used to that. Sooner or later, I will be upgrading the exhaust, but before I do any modifications to the vehicle that could potentially affect the car's power output, I first wanna get a baseline uh, you know, to see how the car performs exactly how it is. 100% stock, nothing done, nothing crazy, regular gas, full weight. I want to see where everything is before I start messing with stuff so I can see how much of an improvement I make. So that's what this video is all about getting a baseline for the Elantra. So personally, I have a lot of fun making these videos. I know it may not be the most exciting to watch, but I love like the analytical part of all of this. I figured now's a good time to get all of these numbers situated so we can start having some fun with the Elantra. So with that, I wanna get a baseline for the eighth mile time, mile per hour. I wanna get a zero to 60 and a 40 to 80. Of course, there's gonna be some other metrics in there like 60 foot, 330, all of that. So all of these numbers are going to be a nice starting point to see where this car ends up. And as I mentioned, it's going to be full weight, full tank of gas. Everything's in the interior, spare tires in the trunk. I haven't crapped today, so I don't have any weight reduction going on in myself. This is like the worst case scenario, but most realistic scenario for this car on the street. I'm not even gonna launch it, not gonna do nothing crazy. I'm just gonna stab the gas pedal and see what the car does. I'm also gonna take a data log. Now, unfortunately, I spent all that money on the HP tuners, software, and everything, the logging device for the Mustang, and sadly, they don't really support Hyundai vehicles. I think they support the Veloster. They don't support this one. From what they do support, I have very limited parameters in what I can log, which is very unfortunate because there's a lot more data that I would like to acquire from the car that I just can't. So we're gonna make do, we're gonna do what we can, see where it falls, and hopefully it's not gonna be as bad as I think it is. And there's always that possibility. So with that, I do need to go top the tank off, so I'm full weight. I'm gonna go top it off with some fresh 87. Yes, you heard me right, 87. That's all this car requires from the factory. Kind of like a lot of the EcoBoost cars. But with that, I am curious about something with this car, which is why I kind of want to get a baseline because I'm going to test and see uh, if there's any performance difference on a stock calibration by just running 93 octane and nothing else. So that will be a, a video at some point after this one, but let me explain why I'm doing that. So let's take a peek in the manual here. We're gonna come in here, fuel requirements. Your new vehicle is designed to obtain maximum performance with unleaded fuel. And then it says, your new vehicle is designed to perform optimally using unleaded fuel having an octane number of 87 or higher. Here's what I find interesting. This paragraph says the car is designed to obtain maximum performance with unleaded fuel, but it doesn't specify what octane of unleaded fuel you need to obtain maximum performance because this paragraph says it's just designed to run optimally, but it doesn't mean max performance, but does optimally mean max performance? I don't know. So perhaps that there is some power to be gained on the factory calibration by using 93 octane over 87, much like the EcoBoost cars. Maybe there is an octane adjust ratio and it will adjust some things so the car will run a little bit harder with 93 in the tank. So with all that out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and get to the gas station, top off, go make my run, then we'll come back and look at the numbers. So hang tight, the next clip you're about to see is the drag you run. We'll see what it does. Well, I'm back and as you could see, yeah, this thing is not winning any races anytime soon. Maybe never at all, but the point is it's a lot slower than what I'm used to. So with that, I'm gonna go back over the numbers here with you, kind of run down how I feel about everything. Um, starting with probably the, one of the more important statistics and that's the eighth mile run of this car. It did it in 9.74 seconds at 74 mile per hour. 9.74 seconds equates to a low 15, like a 15.2, maybe a 15.19-ish uh, quarter mile time, which 
honestly is exactly where I thought this car would be. Nevertheless, it's not slower than I was expecting. It's exactly what I was expecting. Uh, zero to 60, 6.87 seconds. That was a bit slower than I was expecting. I think a lot of that because the car is full weight. I noticed as I've driven the car around, it uh, definitely is a lot more quicker <laughs> going through the gears when there's less fuel in the car because there's less weight, but being full weight definitely hinders its performance. And it is a bit warmer today. We've had cool days here not long ago, last week after Hurricane Milton came through here, left us with some beautiful weather afterwards, after it crapped all over the state. This car loves cold air, like any turbo car does. The way Hyundai's tune is on this from the factory, it must hold a lot back when it comes to intake temps. It definitely feels a lot slower. So even just doing the same run full weight on a cool day could probably put me in the high 14 second range. It's interesting to see that. The other time that I'm actually really upset about, this time did kind of shock me, was my uh, 40 to 80 run. You know, I've had so many 40 to 80 runs with the Mustang that I have a pretty good reference on how quick things are based off those numbers. And I think some of the slowest 40, 80 runs in the Mustang I had were like in the five second range, low five second, when I was starting to tune uh, the new setup, the new engine on just 93 octane. And that was before I went to um, an ethanol blend. At the quickest, it was a four second, you know, 40 to 80 that car was. And at the slowest, it was maybe like somewhere around a low five. This car, on the other hand, man, we have a lot of progress to make up here. <laughs> 7.14 seconds, 40 to 80. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. That one is really tough. There definitely has got to be some improvement there. But uh, with all of that said, overall, the car performed how I feel it should have been. Now I want to go ahead and take a look at the log. I want to see what was going on with this thing throughout that run and see where hopefully we can make some improvements. So let's take a peek at the log real quick. Let's see what this thing is doing. All right, let's take a look at the log here. Let's see what this thing was doing. Now I want to say that I did run the car out a little bit longer than I needed to only because I really want to load this thing up. I want to see what it was doing at the limit. So I ran it out a little bit longer than I needed to. At the beginning of the run, I noticed right away that it does short shift on the one two gear change around 6100 where every gear change after that seems to be at 63. I guess that's some torque limiter or something that they do. Uh, the Mustang was the same way actually. First gear short shifted. Didn't need to, but they do it for some reason, I guess. More or less, what we're really worried about is how much boost is this thing making? Well, we can see uh, we have a spike here on the gear change, and that's just because it pulls back timing for the gear change, torque reduction, boost spikes up to 19. Otherwise, at the peak of uh, first gear, it looks like we were at 14 PSI. That's not, that's not too bad. Then it looks like in second gear, it hits 15 PSI, that's where it stops. That must be the cap that's tuned in from the factory. That's as far as it goes. It does have these spikes between the gear changes I find interesting. But as you can see here, see how there are no spikes, 84% boost spike closes that throttle until it gets back down around 15 and opens things back up. So, yep. Good thing about tuning the Mustang, I learned a lot about tuning and how these modern cars work. So that's really cool to see how it's all translating into this vehicle. Something else I find interesting is it seems like the intake is not super effective, which is one area I am looking to upgrade. Usually factory intakes nowadays are pretty good, but take a look at this. It, the run starts off at about uh, 97 degrees or so once I get moving, right? Usually, because you're moving, you're forcing air into the front of the car, your IAT at the filter generally goes down. Look at this one. It only goes down right here, 95. So it starts at 97, goes down initially, 
as the run goes on, we went all the way up to 104 degrees. So that's interesting. It seems like it's only effective up into a certain point, which is 65 mile per hour. So it's really only effective at normal highway speeds. Past that, it actually starts raising the intake temps. That's interesting. Usually I don't see that on factory intake setups. Usually they still manage the temps good. It's just they don't flow as great as you would want them to once you start tuning. So there's definitely an area for improvement there. Furthermore, look up here. With the 2.3 EcoBoost, the fuel rail pressure with the stock high pressure fuel pump would peak just over 3000 PSI. Look at this dang thing. It goes all the way up to 45, 4600. So there's peaks here, 4700 PSI. But look, I mean, it's still running 4600 PSI, pretty much the whole run consistently 45, 4600 PSI of fuel pressure. This thing's got a serious high pressure fuel pump. I don't know what it flows, but in terms of providing pressure to the injectors, man, this thing's got some serious balls to it. But taking a look at other things, these other two lines, the white and blue is my commanded Lambda and what the car is actually running. There was a dramatic, I mean, a super lean spike here uh, but that was during the shift. So, you know, the timing went back. A lot of boost probably just end up passing through the exhaust and you get a false lean. I've seen that a lot with Buster. So I'm not concerned about that. But as long as we're only getting out on the shifts, I think we're OK. Everywhere else, it's pretty stable as it should be. Uh, it's running 87 octane, nothing crazy. It's running a little bit on the lean side, 0.85 lambda. But that's usually recommended for max power on most fuels is 0.85 lambda. That's where this car is at. Ford, man, they tuned their cars super rich. So this is a hell of a lot leaner straight from the factory, the way Hyundai has this tuned. So that's really interesting to see. Another really nice thing to see is down here. This is your engine coolant temp at the beginning of the run. You know, as you get moving, you start getting the water pump flowing. It goes down a little bit. But honestly, at the end of the run, I mean, a full uh, probably honestly did a full quarter mile run at the end of it. Honestly, I went over triple digit speeds just to make sure that I loaded everything up as best as possible. And it looks like it only got as hot as about 210 degrees. So it seems that the cooling system is pretty adequate stock. So nothing to worry about that. One of the last things we're going to take a look at here is that green line that's your calculated load remember how i mentioned that there is a possibility this car isn't getting full power on 87 octane well it looks like it's making most of its power on 87 octane because if it wasn't this wouldn't be 100 percent there are areas here see how it loads in but that's normal for a car to load in like that in first gear it actually doesn't hit 100 percent at all it does hit 100 percent load here in second gear and then it drops during the shifts and it comes back up but at the beginning of the run it goes back down. So I don't know if that's programmed in it no matter what or that little dip coming out of the gear change could be lessened with higher octane fuel. Maybe that's like a tip in reduction coming out of the gears. But for the most part, you see it, it stays at 100 percent. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at spark. This is super, super conservative with its spark advance, but I would imagine it has to be because it is tuned to run optimally on 87 and it's a 10 to one compression engine. So you can't run too much spark. And as you can see right here, it's pulling back five degrees of timing right here. So yeah, that lines up with the calculated load being 93. So I think if this had a higher octane fuel, it won't pull back as much timing when that first gear as boost loads in. It's pulling back a lot, but let's see what happens in second gear. Um, pulls back a bunch of timing for that gear change. Torque reduction comes back in and then, OK, there we go. That's a lot better. So now we're at 15 PSI and three and a half degrees of advance. And then it drops for the shift. And yeah, three and a half degrees. That's about all we get. We get a little bit of a peak here at before this gear change at a 4.4. Same thing with this gear change out in the back here. We got about five degrees advanced um, right before that gear change. So that's about as much as I've seen it wide open throttle. Overall, very conservative on timing. There's a lot of power that could be had with higher octane fuel 
and just more timing and leaving the boost exactly the same. But that first gear, I feel like there's definitely improvement there. If there's more power to be had in that first section there, as you get through first gear, that's going to lower your 60 foot. Zero to 60 to be faster. Everything will be faster. But it looks like anything beyond that, like my 40 to 80 or whatever, it doesn't seem like higher octane will benefit it at all past that point. But there's only one way to find out. So we'll have to put 93 in and see how that goes in a different video. So yeah, interesting. Uh, this car definitely is not meant to be a full performance car. It has performance potential. You know, it's not a sport car. It's a sporty car. You know, unless you go to the full end, you're not getting a full fledged sports car. That car just has a lot of very good stuff added to it that honestly does. Honda has done such a good job adding all these features and keeping the price down. It's really tough to want to modify an N line when you get so much more an N for about that $10,000 difference to make an N line comparable in all areas that an N already is stock would cost well over the $10,000 difference between both cars stock. It's a little tough, but I knew that going into this and I'm okay with that because this isn't supposed to be a crazy street car, but I do want to make some improvements here over these times. I think there's a lot of improvement to be had. I would love to get that 40 to 80 down into the five second range. That'd be great. If I could get a high 13 second quarter mile time out of it, I'll be happy and maybe somewhere in the high four second zero to 60 could because all of those numbers are kind of what I was used to with the Mustang and all of those metrics were perfectly fine for a street driven car that you have to count on every day. So if I can get to those numbers, things will be great. But the whole purpose of this video obviously was to see where I need to start. And um, yeah, it looks like I have a long road ahead of me to get to where I want to be. But who knows, maybe it won't take as much as I think it will. I'll get there sooner than later. But otherwise, I have a few more videos coming up, kind of going over some of the baseline numbers of this car. I want to weigh the car, see how much it weighs, full weight with me in it, and uh, see if there's any improvements to be made there. Otherwise, it's going to wrap it up here for this video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with everyone you know. And if you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe to the channel. Keep a lookout for next Cars Creative video.